Compare the performance on the final exam of two of my top students from different classes. Who performed relatively better? Did either do unusually well on these final exams? All right, so we have two sort of sets of data here. We have student one, student two. The score for student one was 96 on the final exam. The class that he was in had an average of 56.3, the standard deviation 12.1. For student two, she scored a perfect score, 100% on her final. The class mean for that class was 65.2%, and the standard deviation for her group was 14.1. So let's take a look at the z-score here in order to make the comparison. So how do I know I should use z-scores? Because, of course, it's one thing for me to jump into the calculation, but it's another thing for you by yourself to determine that that's appropriate here, right? So here's the sort of key phrase that we'll look for there. They're asking who performed relatively better. That language, right, when they ask to make a comparison, a relative comparison, right, that is classic language when you want to use a z-score to make a comparison between measurements from two different data sets, right? If they were in the same class, it's very easy to compare. You just look at the scores and compare them directly, right? The higher score wins. But they're in different classes. So the exams are different, and some exams are harder than others. We know that. How do we judge that? Well, we look at things like the average score for the exam, but then there's also this question of how homogeneous are the students, right? How much do they distinguish themselves among their peers? And that kind of goes to the idea of standard deviation. So we need to look at both the mean and standard deviation for their respective data sets. And once we're dealing with that, we're looking at z-scores. So look for that language relatively better. That indicates a comparison using z-scores, right? So it's a relative comparison. And by the way, that's also probably the appropriate comparison to make here, right? Looking at the raw score and saying student two did better automatically because it's higher isn't exactly correct, right? Because again, we don't take into consideration how hard the test was when we do that. We also don't take into consideration how clustered the class was, right? Were scores generally very close to one another? Was it hard to distinguish yourself on that test? Or was it very easy to do that, right? So that all goes to the question of what's the mean for the exam and what's the standard deviation? And then finally, they ask us another thing that's sort of classically z-score. They asked, did either student do unusually well on the exam? So that idea of measuring unusualness using a z-score, right, comes up. And so that's another key phrase that indicates we should work with z-scores. Okay, so now that we know what z-score is, the rest is pretty straightforward. We're going to just use the formula. Z is equal to x minus the mean over sigma. We're going to use it twice. So let's do the first z-score. I'm going to use a subscript z sub 1. The measurement here for student one is 96. That's his score. The class mean was 56.3 and the standard deviation was 12.1. Let's work out that z-score very quickly. So we can do it all at once. If we do 96 minus 56.3, close up the parentheses and divide by 12.1. And when we do that, we get the answer 3.28 a very impressive z-score, 3.28. So the first student's z-score is 3.28. All right, let's take a look at student two. So student two, she scored a perfect 100, so her x value is 100. The mean for her class was 65.2, and the standard deviation was 14.1. Okay, let's go ahead and calculate that z-score then. So I'm actually going to just bring up that calculation that we had before and type in the new numbers. So 100 minus 65.2, close up that, divide by 14.1, the standard deviation. And when we do that, we get the answer 2.47, another impressive z-score, 2.47. However, it's not quite as impressive as student one's because it's not as high, and here, high test scores are better test scores. So a higher z-score implies a better performance. There's maybe only one caveat about this comparison. We have to remember that poor student two here couldn't really do any better than 100% on her test, right? So she had the top grade in the class. Maybe if the, you know, the scale had gone up higher, she would have even distinguished herself further above the class average. But just in terms of z-scores at this point, we'll say student one was the better student. Maybe student two had not been restricted by the ceiling there of the cap of being a maximum score of 100. Maybe she would have distinguished herself 
even further above average. However, you know, you can only beat the test that's in front of you, right? So she got a perfect score on it. She can't do better than perfect. So that might have kind of hindered her performance there. But student one still, because the class average was lower and the standard deviation was smaller, he was able to get a full 3.28 standard deviations above average on that test which indicates an exceptional performance. And as a result, we're going to say he did better than student two. Now to the question of, did either student do unusually well on these final exams? If we use two and negative two as sort of the cutoffs for unusualness, in other words, if you're below negative two, then you did unusually poor. If your z-score is above positive two, then you did unusually well, right? Because on a test, remember high numbers mean good grades. So in this case, since both these scores are above the 2.0 cutoff for where we start to say things are unusual. We'd say they both did unusually well. Again, student one did a little more well on the test because his score is above three standard deviations. At that point, he's clearly distinguished himself as an unusual performer on the test. Um, student two, though, again, above two standard deviations. So we'll say she also did unusually well. And typically, exam scores follow a bell-shaped distribution. So certainly, that means student two is definitely going to be in the top 2.5% of her class. And then student one, of course, uh, is also definitely within the top 2.5%. In fact, we could even say that based on the empirical rule, if we assume the distribution is bell-shaped, that student one is definitely within the top 1% of the class, right? OK, so those are the results. The basic idea is pretty simple. Make the comparison by calculating the z-scores and in this case since higher scores on exams are better the higher z-score is better so student one in this case had the higher score and then unusualness we're just going to look at it in terms of the scale saying hey anything above a positive two as a z-score will be unusual because these are positive it's unusually high and that means above average performance so both students did great on the exam they both did unusually well on these finals